أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد um, Today's subject is really very important and um, related to so many questions people um, ask. So, inshallah, I hope we can cover um, all of it, inshallah, tonight. Um, we are going to talk about shurud as salah things that, are, that we have to observe before uh, we start our salah, or the prerequisites for our salah. Um, last time we talked in length about the first one, which is, remember? Yeah, we have to make sure that the time of Salah has come, all right? I like this. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. We cannot start before the time, right? Is there any exception for this? Can we start sometimes the Salah before its time comes? Yes, when? Yeah, if you are traveling and you can pray Dhuhr and Asr at the Dhuhr time or Maghrib and Isha at Maghrib time, these are the exceptions. Um, or you are traveling or if you are sick or um, uh, for any other valid um, necessity. Uh, but generally, we cannot pray until the time comes. Even if you are traveling, can you pray Fajr before time? Can you pray Dhuhr and Asr before Dhuhr time? Can we pray Maghrib and Isha before Maghrib time? So, the same rule applies also, maybe a little differently, but the concept is the same, right? We have to make sure that the time has come before we start. And we said last time, we cannot be 100% certain that the time has arrived every time, right? Um, and if you think of the job of the Mu'advin, or the responsibility rather of the Mu'advin, it's not like today's at that, with all due respect to the Mu'advins here, you know, some of them are here. You know, it's not just knowing the time, uh, watching at your clock and just call that then. It's, it's much more than this. If you are a Mu'adhin, designated Mu'adhin, this means that the entire neighborhood will trust you. When they hear your voice, this means that you went before Fajr, looking and waiting and waiting for Fajr. You don't have watched at that time. Until you see Fajr, then you go and call that then. Right? And the same thing for Dhuhr. You have to observe the shade and there's no shade. And the beginning of the shade, us, we have to measure the shade, and Maghrib, we have to observe the sunset, and Isha, you have to observe the absence of a shafaq. So it is not an easy task, you know? It is not that easy. Um, you have to go and observe and call. But now, of course, calling Adan is, is, um, is much easier. But you don't have to hear the Adan if you have any means, like a calendar or app or computer uh, program, then, then you can start. Is it 100% accurate? Not necessarily, but this is the best we know. So it is enough, as, an ulama, as our ulama said, that غلبت الظن is enough. You don't have to be 100% certain. If you believe that's most likely it's the time now and you go and pray, then your salah inshallah will be valid. But, but you need to find out. Either ask someone that you trust or uh, make your own ijtihad in this. Second and the third prerequisites uh, related to Tahara. The first kind of Tahara is Tahara from Al Hadath. The second kind of Tahara, Tahara from Najas. We talked about this before. The Hadath, we have two kinds of Hadath, the minor and the major Hadath. The minor Hadath means that you don't have wudu. Then to remove this minor Hadath, all that you need to do is to make wudu, right? And if you have a major Hadath, like, like what? Janaba, or for women, the end of menstruation or the post birth bleeding, then they um, remove this hadath akbar by taking shower. Now they can start their prayer. So, tahara from hadath, two kinds of hadath, and tahara from najasa. Najasa, whether it is on your body, clothes, or the place. So, these three things must be clean, right? Um, of course, there are plenty of hadith and, and, 
الآيات يا أيها المدثر قم فأنذر وربك فكبر وثيابك فطهر purify your clothes there are of course literal meaning and figurative meanings but the literal meaning or obvious meaning is purify your clothes and we know the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib who talked about when he said that I used to suffer from the, so much madhi that comes out and I sent someone to Rasulullah to ask him because I was trying to ask and he told him no, wash your body, okay, and your clothes, and pray, right? You don't have to take a shower, right? you, can, you have to make wudu after that, but you need to, he emphasized washing the body, right? Like after urination, for example, we have to wash the body. Um, and um, the other hadith, when he uh, told the uh, lady um, to wash the blood in her clothes, and then she can pray in this clothes. And the hadith, the other hadith um, of the Bedouin who came and urinated in the corner of the masjid, and Rasulullah said, uh, purified by pouring a bucket of water on it. That would be sufficient. The place can be purified by just pouring water on it. Um, now, an interesting point um, the ulama discussed. Uh, I would say that the mass majority of the scholars say that these are conditions for salah. Others said, no, the Salah is Sahihah if someone prayed with uh, dirty or not dirty. Uh, there's a difference between dirty and impure. Could be dirty but still pure, right? But if someone intentionally prayed in a clothes that contains najas and he knows about it, they said they, he had neglected or violated one of the wajibat, which is, you know, uh, of course, it's not, it's not appropriate. But the Salah itself is, is correct. A very um, um, my small minority of, of the scholars said, no, that's, it's Sunnah, it's better. It's always better to clean it, but it's not a must. But of course, obviously, the Adilla, the, so many Adilla support the first opinion that it is sharp Sahah. In other words, if, if the Salah is performed in this clothes or if the place is not clean, then Salah is not valid. What if someone, which happens all the time, he went um, back home and he was changing his clothes and he found there's, there was najas in his clothes, right? It happens. And people ask this question all the time. When they take off um, their clothes and they found their underwear, some najasa, somehow. What uh, should he do? Should he repeat every salah he prayed when he was outside or just the last salah or he doesn't have to. Three opinions. The first opinion said no, there's no need for him to repeat his salah because he did not know about this najas. And this is the opinion of Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, al Imam al Zuhri, Imam al Shabi, Tabi'een, and uh, Imam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, also he um, adopted this opinion. The second opinion is that he must repeat the Salah if he found out this Najasa at the time of the Salah. So let's say he uh, prayed Asr in the Masjid, for example, and when he went home, he found out that this is Najasa, and it's still time between Asr and Maghrib. He can pray Asr or re-pray Asr, then he must pray. But if the time passed, he found out after Isha, then he doesn't have to repeat us or Maghrib, but he repeats only Isha. This is the opinion of Imam Malik, rahimahullah. And the third opinion is that he must repeat all prayers. Okay? And uh, obviously the first opinion sounds more legitimate um, because the evidence are strong and this is the opinion of so many. Um, uh, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, rahimahullah, Abdullah ibn Umar, that he doesn't have to repeat it. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ فِيمَا أَخْطَأْتُمْ بِهِ Whatever you do by mistake, no, you're not responsible for. وَلَكِنْ مَا تَعَمَّدَتْ قُلْبُكُمْ You're responsible for what you have done intentionally. Right? So, uh, this is, Allah alam, the, the, the stronger opinion. Now, the question may come, so what if someone, after he performed his salah, found out that he prayed without wudu? He thought he had wudu, but when he is done, he said, oh yeah, my God, I forgot, I used the bathroom, I did the salah without wudu. 
Should he repeat Salah or not? Yes, definitely he has to repeat Salah. Why? What is the difference between this and that? Why he does not have to repeat the Salah if he found Najasa? He's not aware of it. Or, and, and repeating Salah for not having wudu. Because not having wudu is an amr, or having wudu is an amr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to, إِذَا قُمْتُ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ فَغَسِلُ وُجُوهَكُمْ وَيَدِيَكُمْ The Prophet said, Allah does not accept Salah without, without tahur. لَا يَقْبَلُ اللَّهُ صَلَاةِ بِلَا تَهُور وَلَا صَدَقَةً مِنْ غَلُورِ كَمَا قَالَ صلى الله عليه وسلم um, And not to pray while having the jasa on your body or clothes is a prohibition. And in prohibition, it is often forgiven if someone forgot or if he's ignorant, does not know. A new Muslim um, does not really know, and there was najasa, and he prayed, so that's, that's, that's forgiven, khalas, you know, don't do this again. Or someone did not see it, did not know it. So if he forgot, or he did not know, or he was ignorant, that can be easily forgiven. But when it comes to the awamir, you know, ignorance is not an excuse. You have no excuse. You pray without wudu, that's not, that's not going to be accepted. Because I don't know. You don't have to be a faqih to know that. You know, that's one of the basic information that all Muslims must know. And if you forgot, then you, it's like someone forgot to make sujood or make ruku. You, you, you cannot do that. Although wudu is short and requires fard, but um, when it comes to the awamir, then we have to um, uh, observe it. All right, any questions here before we move on? So we talked about time, two kinds of tahara, right? Tahara from Najasa, tahara from Hadath. Okay, the fourth one is Satrul Aura. Obviously, we cannot pray naked. We have to cover our Aura. And what's Aura? The question becomes, what is Aura for the man? And what's the Aura for the woman? What should be covered our body? Uh, two opinions, as, as you know. Aura, some ulama said al-Aura here refers to al-Aura al the pubic region, front and the back, right? What covers, what the underwear covers, basically. That, that's, that's the Aura al And this Aura mukhaffafa. This Aura still but mukhaffafa between the knee and the navel, right? So these are the two opinions. And I, we want to practice this uh, um, Research methodology, if you want. When you have two reports um, um, that contradict each other, so which way to go? And this is an example of the some hadith that sound contradictory to one another. Number of hadith in this side, other hadith in that side, referring to the thigh in particular. Is the thigh part of our aura or not? Should the thigh be covered or not? We see now our youth; they come and pray with a short. And, for some, that's big no. That's, this salah is not acceptable because you prayed while your aura is not covered. According to the first opinion, that the aura mughallaba only um, uh, should be covered, this salah is okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that because the thigh is not aura. According to the second opinion, no, this salah is not valid because he did not cover the aura because the thigh is aura. Number of hadith, let me start with the hadith that suggests that th the thigh is not Aura, it's okay if you pray without um, covering your thigh. The first hadith on Aisha radiallahu anha that the Prophet was sitting in his house and kashifan an fakhibi sallallahu alayhi wa So he, he uh, was not covering his thigh in his house. Maybe it was very hot at that time. Allah alam. And Abu Bakr um, asked for permission to come in. He allowed him. He came in and was talking. And Umar came. And then when Uthman came, he saw Salam changed and he covered his thigh. So I shall observe this. He's a very good uh, observer. If you look at many hadith, you'll find out that she used to pay attention to some uh, detail that happened in his house. So the Rasulullah, you know, when they left, I, saw, I noticed that, you know, uh, you changed when Uthman came and he didn't do the same for Abu Bakr, her father, and, and Umar. Why is that? So, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, should I not shy from a person that even the angels shy from him? He was very shy, rahimahullah, Uthman. 
very shy person. And shyness is part of Iman, as Rasulullah said. Al-Hayaa'u Shu'batun min al-Iman. So, the understanding that the shyness of this person, so he وسلم, considered this, so he covered his side. Hadith in, in Muslim Ahmad and Bukhari narrate this muallaqan, not in his Sahih. The second hadith that's in Bukhari and Imam Ahmad and others narrated this hadith that Anas said in the day of Khaybar, the clothes of the Prophet ﷺ withdrawn, and I could see the whiteness of the Prophet's thigh. Hadith Anas um, that we refer to later. This is a hadith of Anas. That he noticed and he saw that the clothes of the, Rasul, of, of the Prophet ﷺ went up and he saw the whiteness of his thigh. Imam al Allah said, if, if the thigh is awra, um, then the Rasulullah ﷺ wouldn't allow anybody to see the awra of the Prophet ﷺ, right? So, in the other hadith, the Prophet ﷺ hit the thigh of one of his companions and asked him a question, and he hit his thigh like this, and he answered this question. And the Hazm said, if the thigh is awra, the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't have touched someone else's aura, whether um, that it was covered or uncovered. So, and, and to him it's clear that the thigh is not aura. Uh, the other group um, used another report to argue that al-fakhid is aura, so it should be covered. Um, Two ahadith, I will just mention two ahadith. Um, Muhammad ibn Jahsh قال مر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على معمر وفقذاه مكشوفتان The Prophet passed by one of the Sahaba, his name is Ma'mar, and his thigh were not covered, and he said غطي فقذك فإن الفقذ عورة Cover your thigh, because thigh is عورة. Okay? Hadith Rawa Ahmad and Imam Al-Hakim um, and Al-Bukhari معلقاً also in his hadith. Sahih. The second hadith, this uh, of hadith of Jurhud, radiallahu uh, anhu, who said, Mara Rasulullah, he saw Salam alayya burda, or calling Kashabat Fakhri. Jurhud said, Rasulullah Salam passed by me and I was uncovering my thigh, right? Fakal, Rati Fakhidak, in the Fakhida Aura. Same thing, he said, cover your thigh because it is Aura. Hadith narrated by Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad, Abu Dawood, and Tirmidhi. And Imam Bukhari, Bukhari also uh, uh, narrated it, Mu'allaq also in Sahih, not part of the Sahih. Now, which way we should we go? Which should we go? There are hadith here and hadith here. Of course, Quran did not say anything about this particular question, but we have these hadith uh, present. Some ulama even said the the knee itself is our other said no 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 it is bet what's between the knee and the navel, but the knee itself is not our. So, so when you like when you say to someone between my whatever between my two homes is yours, right? What does this mean? Does this include the two homes? Does not, right? So uh, even who, those who said the aura is between the navel and the knee, they excluded the navel and, and, and uh, the navel and the knee. But now re re regarding these two. Um, re uh, um, uh, reports which one we should take because if you follow one then you neglect the other um, Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, he reached the conclusion Imam Bukhari he looked at this hadith in, in this particular subject and he said that the hadith of Anas which hadith of Anas Khaybar when he saw the whiteness of the fire of the Prophet Asana, he said this is Imam Bukhari giving his conclusion. He said the hadith of Anas is stronger. And when it comes to Isnad, Asnad. Asnad means the Isnad from Anas to, to him. This hadith is much, um, uh, it's more sound, right? But the hadith of Jurhud, the last hadith we mentioned, when the Prophet passed by him and told him to cover his thigh, he said the hadith of Jurhud, Ahwat. The meaning is ahwat. Ahwat means safer. 
So the soundness of the hadith, when it comes to the technical meaning of the sound hadith, no, hadith of Anas, according to the science of hadith, is stronger. But the hukm that we can find of the hadith of Jurhud, that says the Fakhr al awra is Ahwat. Ahwat means to be in the safe side. It's always good to cover this entire area. Right? But as we, as we can see, it's not, it's not um, uh, one is absolutely right and the other is absolutely wrong. Right? So if you see a young man praying with a short, you know, let go. Okay? Because this on the hadith of Anas, that's okay. But it is Ahwat, it's better to cover, of course. It's better to cover. If you have the time and the chance to cover everything between the navel and the knee is, is, is better, right? Just to be away from this disagreement, right? Because no one will, will, will criticize you if you cover, but the second team or second group will criticize you if you don't. So these are the two ways of looking at this contradictory hadith. When it comes to women, if their aura in Salah is the same as, as outside of, of Salah, covering everything except face and the two hands. How about the feet? Only Abu Hanifa said it's not aura. Can she pray and her feet are not covered? Only Abu Hanifa said yes. The rest of the ulama said no. The feet must be covered as well. Whether if she has a long shirt or she covers them with socks or whatever. But showing the feet only according to Abu Hanifa is okay. Why? He's, he used an allegory. Um, he said if, you know, if she can show her face and her hand and her face shows more beauty, right? And, and, and when she buys and sells and people can see her hand, so the feet is less attractive than the face and the hand. So there's nothing wrong if and if she prays with her feet uncovered. What's the conclusion? Again, to be in the safe side, if you are praying at home or coming to the masjid, it's always better to cover your feet, just to stay out of this, this because the majority of the scholars said must be covered, the feet of the uh, woman. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And Aisha radiallahu anha, um, And the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah does not accept the salat from a ha'id. Ha'id means menstruating. And he is referring to the girls who attain this age and older, of course. So when um, for a, you know, a mature Muslim uh, girl or woman, their salat is not accepted except by khimar. Khimar, khimar is, is and, and, and the word kham also, kham, kham, wine, and khimar. Uh, they have uh, something in common, which is that they cover. The khimar is the cover that women they use to cover their heads, right? And they cover, and khamr also cover the brain or, or the consciousness. So when people get intoxicated, their brain is, is gone, right? It, it's not functioning. So, so uh, khimar, the uh, bita uh, of al-ras. Um, and he was asked, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, أتصلي المرأة في درع وخمار بغير إزار درع وخمار درع is like a long um, uh, shirt and whatever covers her upper part the head and the neck and so on in the old days it's not like now we have you know different kind of underwear and undershirt and, and you know underpants and we, we, in the winter sometimes we can wear like maybe five six seven pieces of clothes um, but in, in, at that time, they don't have this, you know, luxury, uh, most of them. So he, Sallallahu was asked, would it be enough for a woman to pray in a khimar and a long shirt? He said, yes, if this shirt covers um, her feet, all right? Or dhuhur qadamayha. Dhuhur qadamayha means the, the upper part of the Feet. Because if you make sujood, it might appear from the back, but that's fine. But the, the shirt must be long enough to cover their their feet. Right? 
Another hadith Aisha Dallah was asked, um, how many clothes, how many pieces of clothes do, do they have to have a pant under, under, under this shirt? Do they have to have sirwal, yani, or shirwal, as we say? Uh, it's, it's really sirwal. I don't know who added three dots there for shirwal. Huh? I know, I know. Yeah. But I, I'm sure it's coming from Arabic, right? Because it's sirwal. We'll say Shirwa, that's fine. As long as we know what we're talking about. Um, they asked Aisha, how much clothes, like how many things that must be um, on her body to, to, to pray in? And she said to the one who asked it, go and ask Ali ibn Abi Talib, because he has more knowledge of this. And come back and tell me what he said. And he came back, he went to Ali ibn Abi Talib, and ask him, and he told him, Fi khimarin, but there is sab. It's sufficient to have a khimar and long shirt. Sabir. Sabir means covers her body. And he came back to Aisha and he told her about Ali's answer, and she said, Sadaq, he said the truth. That's the minimum to cover the head and the up, uh, you know, neck and, and shoulder, and to have a, a, a long shirt that covers the feet. Um, can we pray without covering our heads? Men. Yes or no? I remember um, I was in Pittsburgh at that time and there was a jama'at coming to, you know, the Islamic center of Pittsburgh. I was the imam there and was reading salah without a hat. And this brother of this particular jama'at, he said, Imam, how can you, how come that you pray without? Don't you know that it's better to, it's, you have what, 40 time reward if you cover your head? And I said, well, I've never heard about this, but can you please let me know where can I find this particular point? He said, yeah, it's in the book. What book? Oh, books of fiqh. You know, if you pray, if you cover your, your head, you get 40 time more reward than not praying without covering. Of course, this, that's not true. It's Basically, a tradition um, to cover uh, our head or not to cover it's up to you. There's nothing, there's no extra reward if you cover, there's no less reward if you don't cover. It's not even uh, mustahab or, or preferred. We do it so because we feel comfortable doing that, right? I heard that in, in, in some masajid, if, if you are not covering your head, someone will just put a hat on your head, right? And I saw this in, in some massage in Oxford, the Islamic Center of Oxford. They, they have, when you enter, um, you, there are like a big bucket of full of hats. Unfortunately, all of them are, are dirty. Where? Oh, before I come. Oh, that's okay. Huh? No, no. It's purely tradition. There's no hadith. And if you know any hadith that says there's any virtue of covering your head while you're praying, please let me know. In fact, there are other reports suggesting that the Prophet used sometimes takes off his amama and put it in front of him as a sutra. So nobody should pass uh, uh, between him and the sutra, right? So he used it as a sutra. He, it, it, it happened that he prayed وسلم, without covering his head. Um, so um, just need just to take it easy, right? If you want to have a hat in Ramadan, it makes you feel more spiritual. Great, wonderful. If you don't want to use it, it's up to you, right? And if you want to cover, you can cover with anything, right? It doesn't have to be um, come with different, with particular color or shape or any of these things. Of course, you know, are all made in China, anyways. All right, the fifth one is the fifth prerequisite. We talked about time, two kind of tahara. We talked about sat, laura, right? And um, the fifth one and the final one is facing the qibla. Al Quran talked about this in Surah Al Baqarah. It is very clear command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know the story. The Prophet used to face both Mecca and Medina when he was in Mecca. 
right? Um, for those of you who are familiar with corners of the Kaaba, between the Hijr al Yamani and the Hajr al Aswad. Hijr al Yamani and al Hajr al Aswad. So, this is if you, if you pray towards this side of al Kaaba, then you are practically facing both al Masjid al Haram and al Masjid al Aqsa because this goes all the way north. But when they went to al Madina, they cannot do this. So, either or. So, they prayed 16 or 17 months facing al Masjid al Aqsa and, of course, giving their back to al Masjid al Haram because, because it's south. Masjid al Aqsa is north and Kaaba is south if you are in Medina. And after 17 months, Al Quran came. Beautiful. The Prophet used to look up, waiting, wishing that the command would come from Allah to ask him to face Al Masjid Al Haram, built by Ibrahim and his son Ismail alayhi salam, and so on. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask him to face Al Masjid Al Aqsa? Allah said, Why? Do you know why? Does anybody know why? Muslims were ordered to face Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Hmm? That's a good point. Yeah, it is the same religion, the same tradition. It is Allah who tells us what direction to face, right? Um, this is one answer. What else? There is another explicitly mentioned reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, wanted them to face al-Masjid al-Aqsa. وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الْقِبْلَةَ الَّتِي كُنْتَ عَلَيْهَا إِلَّا لِنَعْلَمَ مَنْ يَتَّبِعُ الرَّسُولِ مِمَّنْ يَنْقَلِبُ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ It was a big test to the Sahaba رضي الله عنه, especially those who lived in Mecca for, for so long, because they used to honor al-Masjid al-Haram. This is the tradition of their forefathers. And now all of a sudden, it, isn't it enough to become Muslim? Isn't it enough to make hijrah? No, now forget about your tradition. I'm ordering you to face this direction. And some would not take it. Masjid al-Haram, this is, you know, the Jews have all things to, to, to be proud of. They are the people of the book. You know, they write and read. They coming from this noble family, but this is the only thing we are proud of. This is our connection to Ibrahim, alayhi salam, right? No, Allah. To Allah belongs east and west. <laughs> when Allah told you to go this way, you go this way. Change it to that way, change it to that way. It is Allah who decides. Right? So, but after 17 years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 17 months in Medina, the command came and Rasulullah faced Al Kaaba in Mecca. And someone went to the people of, of Qiba. While, while, while praying. And he told them, Rasulullah you know, faced Mecca. So while they're praying, they, they, they uh, change their, their, their direction. Masjid al-Qiblatayn, those of you who went to Medina, Masjid al-Qiblatayn, unfortunately, they, they, it's bad. Now we can see one mihrab like this. And there, there used to be another one. And I've seen this in the 1990s and, and up until 2005, 2009, but now they, they canceled other. Why is that? Oh, no, because some people mistakenly pray this way. Yeah, put someone there to tell them. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But, um, the point here is that facing Al-Masjid Al-Haram is very symbolic, as we mentioned before, because Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala um, is above time and place, right? But we humans, we live in time and place. We don't see Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We know He's with us wherever we go, right? But when it comes to Salah and Ibadah, we are always um, attached to times and places. So that's why so many people mistakenly connect Al Kaaba to polytheism. You know, why do you go and worship stones? We don't worship stones. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who said, This is my house. Okay? The first house that's ever built in, on earth. 
in the awal masjid al an nas al ladhi bi bakkata wa baraka min dal alamin the first house of worship so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to honor his house and to face this um, the, the direction that leads to this house and also it connects us not only with 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 this masjid but also with all other muslims because when we all face the same direction it's it's very uh, powerful um, symbol of unity uh, between all Muslims. Now, what should we do to find out the direction of al Kaab? Now we have plenty of compasses and smartphones and things, but if it happens that you are somewhere where you don't really know, then you can ask people around you and ask them about the north direction. Here in North America it is 52 degrees roughly, uh, you know, northeast. Uh, or you can see the sun and uh, see the direction of east and west it's before Dhuhr. The, the shade will, 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 will be um, uh, mostly against um, uh, or towards the, 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 way, the, the west and after the it will go the other way. Um, do you have to be 100% accurate? It's, it's not, it's not um, possible to be 100% sure this is the absolute direction to the Kaaba. But we face, as we said last time, that if you are inside the Masjid al-Haram, then you have to face the Kaaba itself. If you are outside of Masjid al-Haram, then you face the direction of the Masjid. If you are out of Mecca, you face the direction of Mecca, right? And that's what we um, uh, try to do when we pray. Um, what if someone prayed and then he found out that the Qibla was wrong? Then he does not have to repeat his Salah, but he should change his direction for the next prayer, right? Can we pray intentionally without facing the Qibla? This is the last point, and then we'll open, inshallah, the floor for questions and answers. Can we? Why, man? Why? Yeah, if you are praying nafil while traveling. Rasulullah used to pray nafil on his camel, and the camel walks in any direction, and he prays nafil. So if you want to pray nafil, um, you don't have to face the direction of the qibla, right? What if someone cannot face the Qibla because he's sick. He is afraid of his enemies. Um, flying, that's a good point. Then you don't have to, you do your best. If in this flight, there is a place like in Saudi Arabia Airlines, for example, there is a place for, for, for Salah, then let's go and face the Qibla and pray. Um, Sometimes the second half of the airplane is empty and you have plenty of space. You can talk to these guys. You can pray. Nobody will um, bother you. But the plane is full and there's no room for you to pray. You pray on your chair. But you have to pray on time. You have to pray on time. And that's the exception. Allah knows this is the exception, right? Don't delay salah as some people do. They fly overseas and they combine five, six prayers when they go to India. That's not correct. Right? If you are, God forbid, sick and in the hospital, if you can change your um, uh, bed to face the Qibla, fine. If you cannot, just pray wherever you are. If you cannot stand, sit down. If you cannot sit down, lay down. And if you cannot, then you pray with your eyes. And I um, visited a number of Muslims in this situation and they don't know, they don't pray. Why? Because they don't, they cannot make wudu, they cannot face the Qibla, so they stay without Salah. And that's not correct. We need to understand this. You can just pray with your eyes. You make a kurkur like this and say, Allah, 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 Akbar, for sujood, Subhanallah, Allah, 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 Akbar, with your head or with even your eyes. But you pray on time. Without wudu, if you cannot make wudu, make tayammum. If you cannot even make tayammum, just pray as, as, as you are. Right? So these are the conditions where we do not have to face um, uh, al-qibla. I'll stop here, inshallah. We can open the floor for questions. Al-Masjid al-Aqsa facing al-Kaaba. 
What do you mean? Here? Yes. Yes. All Masajid must be based on God. We learn Jerusalem or anywhere else. Yes. Right. So do they face Al-Aqsa and Al-Kaaba at the same time or they have to face one and Yeah, but are you facing Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa as well or you are in the not, I mean, not, not inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa if you are outside the Masjid Al-Aqsa um, the Masjid that's beyond the Masjid Al-Aqsa north of the Masjid Al-Aqsa can they practically face both? Oh, okay. All right. All right. But obviously, all Muslims. Right. And if you are Muslim in Nabawi, uh, it, it's obvious. Uh, you know, you are going south. Right? And uh, yes. Yes. خذوا زينتكم عند كل مسجد. Yes, Allah said, خذوا زينتكم عند كل مسجد. Of course, I'm not suggesting that someone comes with a towel covering between his navel and knee and comes to the masjid and, you know, well, I'm covering my arm. I mean, we have also to consider the orf, the tradition, and, um, and beautify ourselves before salah because if we beautify ourselves when we go to weddings and, uh, you know, receive guests at home, we should also look nice when, before we, we uh, yeah, that's the minimum. Yes. In the old days in Arabia, people just have an izar, covers this and, and their bodies in Africa. Huh? In Yemen? Yeah, so, so this is the minimum. Yeah. With the <laughs> Jambiya, go Jambiya. Yes. Yes. Yes, because um, originally you should stand up, but if you cannot stand up, sit down. Uh, no? Well, the argument of Ibn Hazm is that if this awra, Allah would have saved the Prophet from showing his awra. It happened once, according to Hadith al-Bukhari and others, when Quraysh were rebuilding al kaaba when the Prophet was a young boy, and he was helping his uncle, Al-Abbas, by carrying the, the, the stones from one place to the other. So, everybody was taking part of this thing. So, and he told him, and this also explains to you how people dress at that time. He told him, Al Abbas, his uncle, told Rasulullah when he was a young boy, it would be better because he was carrying the stones on his shoulder. And he said, if you take your izar, the, the towel that covers the lower part, if you just take it and put it on your shoulder and put the stones at the top of it, that will protect your shoulder from this. And this means that your awr will be shown. And he وسلم, did this, but he immediately fainted. And it, it, it was narrated that not after this time he was shown naked. He listened to his uncle, but that was not appropriate. So when he did this, he saw Salam lost his conscience and, and fell down, and they took him home. And he was not, n never after this was um, shown um, naked. So Allah takes care of him. So if Allah took care of him, if this was our, Allah wouldn't allow anybody, Anas or anybody else, to see the Prophet's aura, right? And the other one that when he hit the thigh of someone, right? Right? So he said, if it was aura, the Prophet wouldn't have done this to him. So this is his analogy. And if you add to this the hadith that when he was sitting at home and Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman came, that shows you that there was intentional. So, so all these together, the, it makes the, the, the argument.
Okay, some ulama talked about this, uh, uh, the different, or, or the aura of the Muslim woman in front of non-Muslim women, it's the same, like men. Um, and this is, um, again, uh, I don't know any text that says anything about this, but it's based on the concept of trustworthiness. You know, a non-Muslim woman is not trustworthy. I mean, if someone was narrating hadith the prophet and he's not muslim we, we, we cannot take this hadith from him right because he's not muslim he's not muslim right this is not to say he could be a trustworthy person out of this business you know as a neighbor as a person he's a good person but but when it comes to narrating hadith and similarly because um, a person who is not a mean is not trustworthy uh, can go out and narrate what he or she saw inside and that's very important because sometimes even in a gathering of Muslim women only, weddings, and Muslim ladies dress, you know, they take you know, their freedom, but now we have cell phones, we have cameras, and many sisters complain when they found their pictures on the Facebook. You cannot control this. We are living in a time and place where cameras are everywhere. So even if you are surrounded by a like, bunch of Muslim women and dancing together and, and now you can't see this video on YouTube, the whole world is watching it. It's not your property, I mean, you, you cannot control this. But even if you have Muslims around, you have to be extremely careful. Right? She has to cover, yes, according to the hadith, khimar, la salat, la yaqbu Allah salat, ha'idin illa bi khimar. Yes. Well, girls, when they pray, we, we need to train them. This is how you should pray. Have like a khimar and let them pray. So when they grow up, they know. It's the whole concept of praying while they're still young or fasting or they're young is to train them. So we train them, we train them to make wudu before salah, we train them to cover their hair, they have like a hijab for salah only. Um, and, and yeah, so they, 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 they get to understand. If you want to pray, this is what you have to do. That's a good question. You follow the signs. That's very important. You follow the sign. And this happened, actually. Uh, one of the scholars were, were, was flying, and people were uh, on the plane, and they start breaking their fast while the sun is still there. Be but because on the time of the departure, has passed Maghrib. And he told them, well, hold on, hold on. you cannot do that. If you are traveling, you have the right not to fast, right? And similarly apply to Salah. You pray when the time comes. So if you try, if you, if you travel or fly east, and this is what happens uh, to me personally, when I fly to London at 11 or 10.55 p.m., Fajr time comes very quickly because you are going against the sun, right? If you follow the uh, Einstein theory of Relativity, so then you, you, the time is faster. Whereas when you are doing the opposite, the time will expand. So you follow the sign. When the sun sets, pray Maghrib. When you see Fajr, pray Fajr. When, uh, you know, with the, when the Zawal, you pray Dhuhr. So you, you go with the sign. Once you land in Khalas. Again, you are following the sign. Just keep this in mind. Forget about the local time versus non-local. You follow the sign of Salah. So if you are traveling and you see the sun sitting and you know that you will arrive after Fajr, which means that you cannot delay Maghrib and Isha until you arrive. Otherwise, the whole time will pass. So we pray Maghrib and Isha together. That's it. And then you pray Fajr when you arrive. Yes. Yes, if you, if you cannot get outside anywhere, no masjid, no, it's very cold, and you, 
the only place you, where you can pray is your car, just pray in your car. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that this is the exception, not the rule. Don't pray in your car every day. But that's not the norm. The norm is you stand up and face the qibla and pray. But if, if this kind of situation, la yukallifullahu nafsan illa wusaha. Right? Now. No, you, you can do jamr only, but not qasr. Qasr is only when you are traveling. But if you are traveling, going home, and you are going to miss the salah, like they say, dhuhr, uh, you arrive after asr, then you can pray both dhuhr and asr when you arrive home. But you don't shorten, no. Um, no, but not what they are driving. <laughs> yeah, you can pray. As I said, Rasulullah used to pray uh, on the back of his camel, even without facing the Qibla. Yes? You cannot pray at all while driving. <laughs> what are you talking about? No, camel is different from driving now, okay? Camel can go easy and peacefully, and, but, but you are responsible for <laughs> your car, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we'll talk about this. I'll, I'll talk about this in the end. All right. It's a related and non related question, but. Uh, it's, it's good to, to understand the logic behind this. Um, there is a hadith that, in which Rasulullah said, um, whoever prolonged his shirt to touch the floor, this, um, uh, or this ankle will be in the hellfire. And um, in other narration, he said, whoever does this, to show off or to show um, uh, his arrogance, yani, uh, then this is uh, in the hellfire and this salah is not acceptable, right? So now, in Usul al-Fiqh, we study what's known as mutlaq and muqayyid. There's mutlaq and muqayyid and khas and aam, four concepts. When the text gives us a general command, the ulama of Usul al-Fiqh say that there is no general expression unless there is some sort of specification or khas. And the khas is kind of exception to the aam. So, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ Right? If Ramadan comes, you must fast. But there are exceptions. If you are traveling, if you are sick, this, then you can do it later. Right? So there's aam and there's khas. Right? And similarly, there's something called mutlaq and muqayyad. Mutlaq is like absolute, and muqayyad is a condition that comes with this mutlaq um, command that has to be observed. Like when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, tawafu bil bayt al Tawaf is one of the pillars of Hajj or Umrah, right? So Allah said, do tawaf. So, this is absolute, right? But there is something that must be observed to follow this, which is tahara. Can we make tawaf without tahara? No. It's not an exception. It is another restriction that comes to the absolute. So there's absolute command and there is muqayyad. Muqayyad means that it is restricted to this, so, right? So there's a restriction on this command, whereas in Aam is general and there's some exceptions. Okay? Is it clear? Alright. So now when we talk about this, is it mutlaq or muqayyad? Rasulullah said, whoever prolongs his garment is in the hellfire. In another hadith, he said, whoever does this out of arrogance. And in the third hadith, Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, but sometimes my clothes go down. He's like a thin person. So sometimes his 
is the towel that he used to cover himself, it goes down a little bit. He said, no, no, you're not one of them. So is it mutlaq or muqayyad? Is it is prolonging your pant or your, your shirt an absolute that applies to everybody everywhere? Or it is linked or restricted to those who do this at paradise? It's obvious that it is, it is linked or restricted with the other condition that is arrogance. So if you do this out of arrogance, Allah hates arrogant people, right? And if you do this out of arrogance and you go and pray, your salah will not be accepted. But the problem is that some literalists, they go with, no, no, this applies to everybody. That's mutlaq. But akhi, what would you do with this other hadith that says out of arrogance? It's very specific. He said, it's, it's, yeah, it's even worse if you do this out of arrogance, but even if you do this not out of arrogance, it's still bad. Now, if someone has a very short pant, and he's wearing like $5,000 watch, out of arrogance, would this be okay? Now, according to them, yeah, this is okay, because the Prophet talked about the garment. So the two inch more of, of, of clothes, this will put you in the hellfire and so will not be accepted. But if you are dressing these expensive clothes, all right, and golden pants and golden, you know, or, or watches with diamonds and rings, expensive uh, rings, out of arrogance, then according to them, yeah, so I'll be accepted, so I'll be good. Can you imagine? So the bottom line is that this applies to those who do this out of arrogance because at that time prolonging their garments is is shown it's show it is known uh, to be the practice of the wealthy people they, they want to show that we have expensive clothes and we even have long clothes that's why Rasulullah used to make it short why? for two reasons one is to be humble number two is to avoid any dirt and Najasa in the street. And now they're going around, no, no, your brother, your salah. And even worse, they say, oh, if the Imam does it, you cannot pray behind this Imam because salah is not valid and the entire salah is. I don't know why we are very good in trying to find reasons to push people out of Islam. We are very good at this. Now, this is out. Now, this is out. Everybody's out. We are all the only people in. You know? You're either with us or you're out. So now, based on, on this, most of us, our prayer is not, is not accepted. And we are all in the hellfire. But Rasulullah was told what? One of the disease of the heart, which we cannot know. You can see people showing off by wearing these short things. It's the act of the heart. You cannot judge people. So, no, no, no. You know, take it up two inches. Okay, now you're in the hell, uh, in the heaven. Two inches down, you're in the hell. What, what is this? Pant is a little long. Subhanallah. He put them with the mushrikeen and the kuffar. So la ilaha illallah and praying five times a day and making hajj does not count because your pant is two inch long. Well, hasbunallah and ni'mal wakil. All right, is this point clear? Last question before the last question. No, when you are in town, there's no qasr. It's jam'a. You can, can combine the two prayers, but you cannot do qasr. Right? Now, um, you are asked about what happened regarding the observation. We are still doing this. We have done two for Fajr, one for Aisha, and we need to do more. We found actually a better place. Um, and um, we are now trying to recruit also more people who are experts in making maps and, 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 and knowing directions and so on. So uh, we, are, we are still doing this, but uh, 
Um, I, I don't want to reveal so much information about what, because our finding now is not confirmed. We need to have more accurate, and, and this involves um, doing the observation for Fedr in, in, in the night that is clear, and um, the moon should not be that strong, right? Like on the other day, we went to the 15th of Shabbat, the moon was very powerful, and, and this light affects uh, your, your view. Um, you don't want to have plenty of trees and, and, and buildings, no city light, you need to find a dark place. So all these things we're learning in the process. So we're trying to find a clear night, not um, uh, the, 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 where the, when the moon is not that strong, far away from the city light, no obstructions or, uh, to our vision. So alhamdulillah we find a place and we are trying to, the place is important, but we need to find all these things together for our uh, 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 view to be, to be more accurate. And the data we take is, is, is clear and this consensus, but everybody will see something, right? So uh, inshallah, I don't know how long would this take, um, but um, it, it, it must be done. And my humble observation, brother, uh, uh, Shamir al-Haq was with me that, but, but again, that's not final. This is just one time, uh, especially for Isha. And, and I have took, I've taken pictures almost every one minute. So you can see the Shafaq al-Ahmar going down. You know, this was last week. It was absolutely disappeared at 10.32. Um, so to me personally, I would, I would pray Isha at that time. Because I believe this is a sign, and, and I can see it on, on, on my camera. Um, but again, um, it, it's, I was taking this, but, but we, we need to do this again in, in the right place, the right time, and do it a number of times with number of imams and, 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 and experts. So when we all agree on one thing, based on this clear data, date and time and place and, and so on, then, then we'll reveal uh, all this, inshallah. When it's ready. It's it's a little complex, not that easy. We pray when the time comes. If the time comes at ten thirty, you pray at ten thirty. Well, you don't have to wait for the Iqamah Salah of the Masjid. Is this your question? You don't have to, because this time, we made this time. Five minutes in the summer, an hour and a half in the winter. So we, we make this Iqamah time. We can play with it based on convenience. But, but the time begins when the Adhan is made. So you can, of course, you can pray at home at the Adhan time, not the Iqamah time. The Iqamah time is it's human, it's man-made. But the Adhan time is the sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu alayk. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim al-Asr. Inna l-insan lafi khusr. Illa al-lazina amanu wa amanu al-salihat. Wa tawasal al-haq. Wa tawasal al-sab. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Salaamu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah ya rabbil alayhi wa sallam. We'll have inshallah tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, ladies only uh, lecture about Ramadan. So you want to invite your wife or sister tomorrow at 11 a.m. in the ladies' prayer area, inshallah. I'm, I'm working on this. I'm working on this. Most likely it will be next, um, next Friday, but I'm still working on it. Uh, in, in, to replace this uh, fax, inshallah.